Why can we remember the past, but not the future? No, I am not pretending to be a freshman philosophy major cornering you at a party. I'm pretending to be a physicist. Because the inevitable forward march of time is one of the big unsolved problems in physics. And to study that question, scientists have stripped clocks down to their most fundamental parts to try and understand how time truly passes. But in doing so, they stumbled upon a curious fact. It is impossible to build a perfect clock. Whether you're trying to understand subatomic particles or the whole observable universe, you're going to use some math. Specifically, a bunch of equations that represent the laws of physics and tell you how systems change. But the fact that systems change means we have to bring time into those equations, right? Well, it turns out that every basic law of physics is time symmetric. That means it works just as well at predicting what something will look like as it does saying what it used to look like. So if you know every everything there is to know about something in the present, you can run the equations forwards to predict the future or run them backwards to retrodict the past. Which means that from a physics perspective, it's actually not obvious at all what makes the future different from the past. Unless, of course, you are the second law of thermodynamics. This particular law deals with a property that all systems have called entropy, which tells you how random, jumbled up, and messy that system is. It's basically a measure of disorder. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, if you want to make some small corner of the universe a little more orderly, you must must pay for that action by increasing entropy somewhere else. Which is a great excuse to not make your bed in the morning. But there's a second part to the rule. There are far more ways for a system to be disordered than ordered. Imagine taking a novel, tearing out all the pages, throwing the pile into the air, and then sweeping them back up as fast as possible. What are the chances you get them in an order where most, let alone all, of the page turns make sense? This jumbling up process naturally increases disorder. So over time, the second law of thermodynamics also tells us that entropy inevitably increases. And that means we can differentiate between the past and future. The past has less entropy. The future has more. And a couple of years ago, scientists in the UK and Austria discovered that this fact actually has important implications for how we tell time. To measure the passage of time, you need a clock. Doesn't matter what it looks like, it just has to have something inside it that ticks at a fixed rate. That ticking comes from an oscillator, something that goes back and forth in a predictable way. Maybe it's a pendulum in an old-timey grandfather clock that swings once per second. Maybe it's a pair of broken automatic doors that keep opening and closing no matter who's trying to go through them, just as long as they're doing so at a steady rate. However the clock is ticking, moving parts are involved, and those parts are made of particles that, just like those book pages we threw into the air, are jostling themselves into new, almost certainly more disordered, arrangements. So just by tracking the passage of time, a clock contributes some of its own entropy to the universe. And for very small clocks, these researchers found that the entropy a clock produces depends on its accuracy. In this case, accuracy is a technical term. To define it, picture a clock that ticks at a fixed rate. By counting the number of ticks and multiplying by the interval of time between two ticks, you know how much time has passed. Or at least you have a pretty good idea how much time passed, because that counting can never be perfect, and eventually, tiny errors add up. So a clock's accuracy is the number of ticks it takes for it to be off by one. In the case of our grandfather clock pendulum ticking once per second, we'd be asking how long it would take for it to be either one second ahead or one second behind. And these days, the most advanced atomic clocks can run for billions of years before losing a single second. But atomic clocks are absurdly large and complex. So to understand time, the Austrian team focused on the simplest theoretical models of a clock. But they didn't start with something that ticks at a fixed frequency, you know, like you'd expect for even the simplest of clocks. Instead, the ticks happened at random. They couldn't predict when the next tick would actually come. And that might sound odd, but the team was trying to figure out how to measure accuracy at all. They couldn't start by assuming they had something ticking at a fixed rate. But of course, for their clock to be useful, the ticks should be regular. So atop those random ticks, they added a repeating filter. If we return to that broken automatic door example, the random ticks would be a bunch of inattentive people expecting they're just gonna walk right through some opening doors. Any people who randomly approach at just the right time will be let through and get recorded as an official tick. But any person that walks into the doors while they're closed hurts their nose and runs away. 
It's not a perfect analogy, but it shows how the doors help smooth out the ticks from the randomly approaching people. But even with a filter, you're not guaranteed to see a tick once per time interval. Sometimes the doors are open and no one goes through. And that allows inaccuracies to creep in. So once they were armed with this model, the researchers worked out how good this filtering process could be on a super simple microscopic clock. And they discovered that there was a cost if they wanted to improve it. The better the filter, meaning the more consistent the time between ticks, the more moving parts they'd need to add. And adding moving parts is exactly what increases entropy. In other words, the more accurate your clock is, the more disorder your clock will contribute to the universe. But that was just what the model said. So the UK half of this research collab ran an experiment with as simple a clock as they could build, a wobbling nanoscale sheet of silicon in an electric circuit. In the end, the experiment confirmed the models. Higher accuracy means higher entropy. It's almost as if by trying to time how long it takes the future to arrive, you're contributing to it arriving at all. But I should stress this doesn't affect the rate at which time flows for you. There are so many other entropy sources around you that this one can't make a difference. Sorry to all you freshman philosophy majors out there. But we're not done yet. With this result in mind, the scientists in Austria realized that a clock's accuracy isn't the only factor they had to consider. They also needed to worry about its resolution. That is another technical term, and it refers to how small a time step you can see with your clock. After all, you can't use a grandfather clock to time a 100 meter sprint. For that, you'd need a stopwatch with millisecond resolution. But for a lot of science today, you need to go a lot smaller. Like, to watch chemical reactions take place on a molecular scale, you'd need a clock that can resolve a billionth of a billionth of a second. These are atto clocks, and some of the scientists behind their development won the 2023 Nobel Prize prize in physics. They're just as extreme as atomic clocks, but they serve a totally different purpose. Atta clocks can measure the tiniest intervals, but don't need to be accurate for super long times. Meanwhile, atomic clocks have much worse resolution, but can accurately track what they need for much longer times. But could you ever build a clock that does both. A clock that combines the resolution of an atta clock with the accuracy of an atomic clock? Well, according to that Austrian team, the answer is a resounding no. Remember that filtering process they added into their model? To increase their clock's resolution, they needed a filter that worked at smaller and smaller time steps. But that improvement won't mean much if the random ticks it's trying to filter don't come frequently enough. So whatever's making the ticks has to pump more of them out faster. And a clock that makes more ticks is also making more entropy. It's part of the arrow of time and costs resources to make happen. Resources that you may have realized aren't infinite. So ultimately, the team found that the more accurate your clock is, the less resolution it can have, and vice versa. If you try to probe smaller and smaller timescales, you pay for that by being able to track them consistently for less time. In this sense, it's sort of like the famous uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. There's a fundamental limit to how much information you can have at once about two properties. But here, the trade-off comes not from the weird physics that manifests at quantum scales, but from the universe universe needing to increase entropy. It's also sort of like the uncertainty principle in that it doesn't seem to matter to our day-to-day -day lives. The effect only really kicks in at microscopic scales or at the limits of extreme resolution or accuracy. More often, it's other sources of error that limit a clock's ability to track time, like how your wristwatch will lose accuracy if its quartz crystal gets too cold or wet, changing its wobbling rate. But one area where this could become a significant problem is computing. That's because the physical computing that takes place on microchips keeps getting faster. That means computers are computing on shorter time intervals, but they still need to run processes billions of times for exactly the right amount of time to complete those computations. So as computer processors get faster and faster and smaller and smaller, they may start to run into this accuracy resolution trade-off problem. That's especially true for quantum computers. While they're still in early development, they might bring a huge revolution to computing by making calculations exponentially faster than their predecessors. They do that by manipulating quantum objects, but quantum objects are notoriously difficult to use, so you need extra precise control over them, and you need to run lots of processes for absurdly precise amounts of time. So one day, we may reach a point where the impossibility of a perfect clock actually matters. But if you want to use it as an excuse for why you were late to your intro to philosophy class, that's all right with me. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, and an extra big thanks to everyone who supports us through Patreon, because we can't do what we do without you doing what you do. And that also includes freshman philosophy major patrons 
You guys are, you're cool too. 